Welcome to Sedona, Arizona, and this is When Worldviews Collide. Five million people a year come to Sedona, Arizona in these beautiful mountains. It is considered by many to be the spiritualist capital of the United States. There is no place that is more highly concentrated with new age, psychic, clairvoyant, angel worshiping, past life regressing. Every form of religion is here. Every synagogue you can imagine, every mainline denomination is here. There are very few places that are considered as sacred by so many people. It is believed that in these mountains there are these vortices, these epicenters of energy and aura and power. And so people come here from all over the world in search of something to meet their spiritual needs. In the coming weeks we're going to do something unique. For most of us, whenever we talk about a, a major world religion, it's only usually what comes across the television screen or in our newspaper. But we're going to examine the four major world religions as they stand up against Christianity. Hinduism and Buddhism, Judaism and Islam. And in so doing, we're going to examine them from the inside. It's long overdue, don't you think? For most of us, thinking about world religions either makes us uncomfortable yeah! or uh, it's something that seems so distant or far away. But for me, it's something very intimate. My name is Ergun Mehmet Janer. I wasn't born a Southern Baptist or an Evangelical or even a Christian. I was raised as a Muslim. Now, since 9-11, I guess you've seen my people paraded across the television screens. And I'm an immigrant, came from Turkey. Perhaps I don't look like you expected me to. Perhaps you expected to see me dressed like this. Or did you expect me like this? Those aren't actually just stereotypes. They are religious gear. It's called gefya, and I've worn all of them. But perhaps there are things about my people and things about Muslims who come to America that you don't know. For instance, when we came to this country, we came as missionaries to you. This was the late 70s, and my father being a muazin in the mosque, that's a leader, we'll learn that later, we built mosques, and so we came here to enlarge the Islamic community in America. Something else you may not know is that we came over here very devout, and we believe that you hated us. You have to understand that there's two types of Muslims who come to America, and I'm not talking about the sects, I'm talking about devotion. There are those who are cultural Muslims. They come to America for prosperity, and being Muslim is something that only affects them, say, once a year. But for the rest of us, we are very devout. That was me and my family. For the first half of my life, I lived and died by the five pillars of Islam. We fasted during Ramadan. We would read the Quran and kiss it and place it to our forehead and put it on the highest shelf of the house. Five times a day, we would pray towards Mecca, repeating the first surah of the Quran. These are my actual mahabba. These are the prayer beads you use, somewhat akin to the Roman Catholic rosary, except you use it to count the 99 names of Allah. All that, which we'll go into in a couple of weeks, can be summarized very simply by scales. Every Muslim, every single one of us, 1.6 billion on the planet, lives and dies by the scales. We believe that from the moment you are born, when your father whispers the creed in your ear, the shahada, it is that there is only one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his final prophet. From the moment you reach that age of lucidity, every word and every deed and every thought and every desire and everything you ever do or say either goes on good scales or on the bad scales. So that at the end of your life, you have to be 51% righteous to make it into paradise. You would read Surah 23 from the Quran that says, He who finds his scales heavy goes to paradise, and he who doesn't goes to perdition. It was hard at night when my father would say, Ergun, tell me, you know, did you do more good than bad? 
My father was a muezzin and a leader in the mosque, and it's hard to lie to a man that you consider your hero. Here's where the story gets tough. From birth, every Muslim, boy or girl, is taught about the scales. You do the counting at night, you wonder in desperation if you're doing more good than bad, and you know that you're probably lying to yourself. The sad and the tragic part is that there is only one eternal assurance in Islam. Only one. Only one thing erases the bad scales. To die. As a martyr in a declared fatwa, in an act of jihad. The reason I say it's difficult is I know that they are the ones we call terrorists, and I know they are the ones that we call uh, those who have declared war against us, but I want you to see them in a spiritual dimension. Those 19 men, the tens of thousands who fight against us, those who continue to battle even to this day, I want you to understand their desperation. They believe, we believed, that by shedding our blood we will find the one thing that eludes us our entire lives. Forgiveness. Now I want to tell you how I found out that my blood was both unnecessary and, quite frankly, insufficient. What reached me for the gospel of Jesus Christ was not a beautiful church and it wasn't a program, it wasn't a guy on television with a, a toupee and a Rolex watch. What reached me for the gospel of Jesus Christ was one stubborn, tenacious, wouldn't take no for an answer, high school kid. His name was Jerry. Jerry wouldn't leave me alone. Even though I had no friends who were Christians, had never been in a church, he wouldn't take no for an answer. He, he invited me to everything. Hot dog, youth trips, lock-ins. But the thing is, every time I told him no, it's like he redoubled his efforts. After two and a half years, I finally agreed, and I walked into the Stelza Road Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio. They didn't make fun of me, and they didn't call me names, towel head or sand monkey. They didn't make fun of my accent or, or laugh when I didn't know when to stand or sit or turn. They didn't make fun when I didn't even know the difference between the, the hymnal and the Bible. They, they just loved me in spite of me. After the service, Jerry took me to the pastor. He said, Clarence, Clarence, this, this is the one. Like, like he's got to point out the boy who's wearing, you know, Gephia, wearing full gear. And Clarence Miller said this to me. He said, what do you think about Jesus? And I said, oh, Isa. In Islam, we respect Isa. We even named the, the 19th chapter of the Quran after him, Surah Miriam, after his mom. Clarence Miller said this. You can't respect him. It's not one of the options. You see, Jesus said he's gone. And if Jesus said he's God, you got one of two shots, and only two. One, he could be insane. People with mental illnesses who walk our streets and are drunk, and they think that they are God. But the only other option is that he actually was who he said he was, because if Jesus said he was God and wasn't, there's no way he could be a good prophet. And then he explained to me why the cross that Jesus on the cross died and shed his blood and took the wrath of God on his back so that I wouldn't have to. In other words, my blood was redundant. If I may be so crass, Jesus strapped himself to a cross so that I wouldn't have to strap a bomb to myself. I lasted four days in that church. On Thursday night, I came forward, accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that same night, was the last night I saw my father. For me, world religions are not something that we study from a distance. It's not something that we do because it has to be fulfilled for a discipleship training uh, certificate or some sort of study. 4.8 billion people espouse the beliefs we will study in the coming weeks. This is not only important, this is eternal. Do you think these things matter? When my father disowned me, when he disowned my brothers a year later when they were saved, he did it as an act of mercy. When a Muslim comes to faith in Jesus Christ, Muhammad prescribed that they are to be put to death. In, in over 30 countries in the world, that's precisely what takes place. Do you think these things matter? Let me tell you the central premise, what makes this so radically different and what makes this study so radically necessary. 
The thesis of this entire study for the coming weeks is this. God said go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We didn't, by and large. So he brought the world here to your doorstep. We're not talking about world religions. We're talking about your neighbors and your friends, your colleagues and your co-workers. We're talking about those 4.8 billion people. We're talking about the largest growing immigration population in America. And that's why we're here on their turf. Because Christianity has nothing to fear from any world system, any world religion, and any world philosophy. One last caveat. This isn't about gathering knowledge. This is about gathering wisdom. This is about broken hearts more than golden tongues. It's about gathering whatever knowledge we can get so that we understand the people that we run into, so that we understand that beneath the clothing, beneath the veils, and beneath the costumes are beating hearts and open souls for whom Christ died. Thank <laughs> you.